this very special and important venue as we take the trending concept and place it in its true perspective. All souls matter. We pray that you will be blessed by the messages and that some of your questions or concerns will be answered by the speaker. If you have a question, please post your question in the chat screen. At the appropriate time, it will be passed on to the speaker for consideration. And please remain muted during the presentation so everyone can benefit. The Magama Church of Christ is beginning a Zoom format weekly series carrying that same title, All Souls Matter. You're invited to go along with us for the journey. Different speakers from local congregations and across the nation will be invited to participate from time to time. Special topics will be predetermined and a photo and topic of speakers will be featured every week. It will be an ongoing revival and evangelistic effort and a community empowerment effort to provide spiritual enlightenment and stability during these difficult times. I want to call it, it a vaccine for the spiritual virus. It is manufactured and produced by Heaven's Company, headed by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everyone will be able to invest in the stock, but the purchase price will be a currency that the Fed cannot print and the market cannot exploit. It focuses on community outreach, membership empowerment, and evangelism focused on a weekly basis. At this time, we ask you to join us in a word of prayer as we call upon Brother Walter Weathers, an elder at the Carver Road Church of Christ in Greensboro, North Carolina, to word the prayer. Brother Weathers. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we once again thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to come together to hear another portion of your word. Father, we thank you for that, for Brother Harris as he saw fit that we need to hear something about all souls matter. Father, we thank you for the congregation there in Arkansas. Continue to be with them and continue to watch over them as they go they, they meet weekly to preach your word. Father, we come on behalf of Brother Carruthers as he will be speaking to us tonight. Bless him that those things that is relevant to us to hear from you through him, that we may take those words and use them in our lives, Father. Father, we just thank for every soul that is represented here, Father, tonight. Father, we ask you to bless us that we put aside all those things that may help, that may hinder us from the hearing and, and incorporating those words into our lives. Father, we just thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross, that we may have everlasting life. We ask this prayer in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our speaker tonight will be speaking for 30 minutes and will then open up for discussion and questions. Under the theme of All Souls Matter, he will be addressing the topic, Who Shall Deliver Me? Our speaker tonight, Dr. Jefferson Carruthers. He is a native of Anaheim, California, the son of a gospel preacher, Jefferson Carruthers Sr. I had the grand privilege of working with his father in a mission and found him to be a very encouraging person. And I found that same encouragement in Dr. Carruthers. He's been an encourager for me and an example for me in the academia as well as in service to the kingdom. Jefferson Carruthers Jr is a graduate of Southwestern Christian College with an AA degree, from David Lipscomb College with a BA degree, Harding University Graduate School of Religion with an MTH, Cleveland State University with a Master of Education, Faulkner University with a Master of Philosophy. He completed the Doctor of Ministry in 2018 at Hood Theological Seminary. Dr. Carruthers is presently a PhD candidate completing his dissertation on African-American hermeneutics in Churches of Christ. He is married to Felicia Auburn, to Felicia Spinks of Auburn, Alabama. In 1983, they were parents of seven children, one son-in-law, one daughter-in-law, seven grandchildren. Sister Carruthers also attended David Lipscomb College and is a graduate of Memphis State University with a BS. And the University of Mississippi with the Master of Education. 
He's also completed the Master of Library and Informational Studies with a concentration in archival management at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Brother Carruthers has been preaching the gospel since 1977. He has ministered to the Central Church of Christ in Coldwater, Mississippi, the Adams Avenue Church of Christ in Cleveland, Ohio. And he began his ministry with the Carver Road Church of Christ in July of 2005. He has spoken in college lectureship, numerous state and regional lectureships, national lectureships, youth meetings, gospel meetings. He's the author of several tracts and workbooks and writings of the Old Testament and New Testament. He has written Bible school material for 21st century, a series on blueprints. He has also published material throughout Proclamation E Press. Justin Carruthers is on the executive board of the National Lectureship Church of Churches of Christ. He chairs the board for the North Carolina Brotherhood and State Lectureship. He is on the board of directors of the National Teachers Workshop, is a board member of Southwestern of Southeastern Lectureship, chairs the board of Quality Education and Academy and K through 12, the charter school that began at Carver Road, and is on the board of Quality Independent Living, an apartment uh, facility of 42 units uh, that is built by the church. Brother Carruthers also serves as area board representative for Ministers Institute Conference held in Fort Lauderdale, Florida annually. As an educator, Brother Carruthers is an instructor for the School of Religious Studies in North Little Rock, Arkansas. He has also recently accepted an adjunct instructorship at North at New York Theological Seminary. In the year of 2000, he founded the Proclamation Press New Year Symposium held every year in January. It is my distinct privilege to invite you to take time to hear what this man of God has to say. And I want to thank you, Dr. Carruthers, for agreeing to be our teacher, our speaker for tonight. Welcome to the podium, Dr. Carruthers. We now await the message that God has given you to share with us. The microphone is yours. Thank you, Dr. Harris. It's good to share with you again over this uh, pandemic season. We have found ourselves in many venues talking about the word of God and sometimes we're not in the same venue. We've had the distinct privilege of listening to Brother Harris as he articulates the and preaches and teaches the word of God. I'm thankful for our association that goes back 38 years to, to 1982 um, is when we met 1982. We have served together um, at the MIC. In my early years at the MIC, uh, Brother Harris actually was on the podium uh, with me one year. He, he was talking about Ephesians 5, 19 following uh, in the reciprocal manner. And I was being questioned that year on whether or not solos were, were acceptable in the, in the church. That, that might have been 2001, 2002. This is the first year in 20 years that I have not been in MIC. Uh, during this period of time, I am going through some withdrawal and just debating everybody on the sidewalk. It's not a nice day, it is a good day, and uh, these kinds of things. But we, we've, we've enjoyed working um, in, this, in this brotherhood together. Uh, we are proud to be uh, with the, the McArmond Church Christ and Brother Harris, elders and deacons on tonight. We're thankful for this invitation. Certainly proud to have with us on the call tonight the members of the Carver Road Church of Christ, elders and deacons, uh, Bible school leaders, instructors, ministry leaders. Uh, we're thankful to see uh, them uh, uh, on uh, tonight and, and appreciate everybody to understand it. I have uh, 30 minutes and uh, to give the presentation and then questions and uh, answers. I want to uh, read a scripture from uh, we're coming from Romans chapter 7, verses 24, and I'll read uh, into chapter 8, verse 2. Paul writes there, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I agree with the vision of Brother Harris that there, these are as much times for 
evangelism as any other time. His universally known commitment uh, is acknowledged throughout our brotherhood as it is known that he has led evangelistic campaigns throughout the United States and other places, training and mentoring present and future generations in the same. He is recorded uh, in Dr. Robinson's book, uh, Hard Fighting Soldier, as a pioneer in education of preachers among churches of Christ. We thank him for his leadership in our brotherhood national campaigns. And of course, it is acknowledged that a man with such position and positive power must have a spouse who only adds to the great effect he has had uh, in this brotherhood. So we're thankful for Brother Harris tonight and for the real power, Sister Harris, uh, on tonight and for all she has done for him in making him and liberating him to be the man that he is on tonight. We're talking about uh, that phrase from Romans 7, uh, 24, who shall deliver us or oh wretched man that I am. Paul starts off, off with that uh, when he considers this and this, this message uh, is geared toward being evangelistic, even though we are lifting this from a text and one of Paul's epistles to the church. What Paul reveals in this passage gives us reason to take Christ to others. I've been tasked with the assignment from one of the most pivotal books in the New Testament written by the most prolific and productive gospel preacher and church planner in the first century. The book is pivotal and equally so. The text, which I have read and been assigned, is integral to understanding the mindset, spirit, preaching, and teaching of the Apostle Paul. This message seeks to be evangelistic, providing teaching and understanding to those who have not yet entered into the kingdom where grace is abundant, where blessings abound, and where God's promises provide hope as an anchor for securing souls in Christ in this present dispensation. Hearing about the faith, let us introduce Paul as the leading writer of New Testament books. Bearing his signature are the books of Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. These 13 books, letters, and epistles for, form the bulk of correspondence written to the churches of Christ, Romans 16, 16. The other writers to the churches are the apostles Peter and John and the brothers of Jesus, James and Jude. Paul was a well-known and accomplished Jew, having sat at the feet of one of the leading Jewish teachers among the Jews in the first century, Gamaliel, Acts 22 and 3. Paul was a freeborn Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, Acts 21 and 39. In addition, Paul had gained a reputation of being more zealous for the law than his peers, Galatians 1 and 14. As Saul on the Damascus Road, Paul would be the last person to whom Jesus revealed himself for the purpose of commissioning an apostle, Acts chapter 9 and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 6 through 10. My hope is that you have a sense of the accomplishments of Paul. He had a privileged upbringing. As a Jew, he had a promising future. Lost, Christ revealed himself to Paul at a moment that would be pivotal in his life. As a self-publisher, he produced more inspired letters with the guidance of the Holy Spirit than any other writer. As a prognosticator of the gospel, he witnessed few and many respond to the gospel of Christ. As a progenitor, he developed young men in the faith, not the least of whom were Timothy and Titus. These entries uh, to a life story would be enough for the most of us to look back and to be satisfied with our lives. But Paul would have us know that with all one accomplishes in life, one is never who he or she should be unless that person understands why an apostle would declare, oh, wretched man that I am, and then ask, who shall deliver me from this body of sin and death, Romans 7, 24. Thinking about it or reflecting on it, it is as surprising as the 100 meter dash record setting champion declaring, oh, I am so slow. It is like Catherine Hepburn, who's won more Oscars than anyone else, declaring, I wish I knew how to act. It is like Audra McDonald, African-American lady who's won more Tonys than anyone else, revealing that she felt she did not know anything about theater. What, what can we say to Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, and the like, when they uh, declare that they have no grasp on science? 
What about Michael Jackson confessing that he's a miserable dancer? Or Martin Luther King dismissing his experience in nonviolent protest? But Paul, as an accomplished apostle, says, Oh, wretched man that I am. Understand that Paul arrives at this declarative statement that leads to a doxological conclusion because he knows something about humanity and certainly humility. We know, we should know in short, that Paul grapples with the thought of how a holy God can maintain fellowship with an unholy people, a sinful people, a people who try as they might appear to be trapped in a body of sin. These people are God's creation. He loves them, God does. He provides for them. At the same time, because he has given them freedom, they often, uh, they often fall short of living according to his holiness. How then can God justify maintaining fellowship with a people who fell and who are unholy? Let us establish a few principles that establish that uh, lay the foundation for a rationale for evangelism, the declaring of the gospel to all creation. First, understand this. At our best, when we have accomplished beyond our imagination, when we have excelled in life, when we have striven to do right by our neighbors, when we discover even that uh, what we would do, we do not, what we know better than we fail to achieve. There is always something that causes us to fall short of our expectation, and everyone is a victim. Paul would explain that this is a sinful nature that acts like a law in our flesh, Romans 7, 14 through 21. Let me say that again. At our very best, when we have accomplished beyond our imagination, when we have received plaques and laudations, when we look back and are satisfied, when our neighbors are singing our praises, when the church congratulates us on our faithfulness, through all of that, we must remember that we are never who we ought to be unless God has touched our lives, unless he has done something for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul would have his readers not only uh, acknowledge that they fail and, and uh, doing, uh, when doing their best, fail at being their best, but their failures in their lives are what is described as sin. That is when we do wrong. In the writings of Paul, there is a sense of what is right informed by nature and better informed by the law. Romans chapter one, he talks about how all of humanity is informed by nature. Romans chapter two, he talks about the privilege of having the law, the law from God. And so he establishes a law of nature and then a law of God. In the law of nature, there is a sense of what is right and what is wrong. He explains this about the Gentiles. They do by nature what is right. But do not forget that even when we know what is right, we cannot always find the power to do right. And that's all of us. Let me say that again. Even when we would do right, even when we want to do right, when we want to be at our best, there's something about all of us that makes it impossible to accomplish what we would. And understand that, that Paul acknowledges laws that affect humanity. And, and uh, we talked about the law of God and Paul says about it in the seventh chapter, uh, verses 12 and 14, that that law that is revealed, it is, it is more informative than, than the natural law. That law which is revealed is more informative than natural law in that it gives us some, some understanding of the character and the being and the justice of God. Paul says about it in Romans 7, 12 through 14, that that law is holy, that law is just, that law is good, and that law is spiritual. Again, that's Romans chapter 7 and verse number 12 and verse number 14. That's, that's the first understanding about the law in chapter 7. Second, Paul acknowledges a law of sin and death fighting his spiritual inclinations to do good. Romans 7, 22 through 23. That would be good if there were just, just, just God's law and we could know God's law and do it. But Paul says it's not like that. There is a law of God, but then there is a law of sin and death that fights our spiritual inclinations 
and manifest itself uh, in, our, in, our, in our flesh, in our carnal desires. It reads in Romans uh, chapter uh, 7 there, and verse number uh, 22, Paul says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But he says, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, the law of God is, is, uh, is, it informs the mind. But Paul says there's a law of sin that brings him into captivity by way of his, his members, all of our members. That that flesh, that that desire to satisfy, that moment when we would do good, but we find ourselves doing something else. So the law of God is holy, just, and good. But there is a law in our members that that is a law of sin and death. And then Paul's going to end talking about laws in Romans chapter eight, verses two and three, when he talks about the law of the spirit of life found in. Uh, Christ Jesus, the law of spirit and life found in Christ Jesus. So the law of God is good, spiritual. Man can match it to some extent, ex extent by his understanding uh, of nature and what is right and what is wrong. Then there's this law of sin and death that controls both those who knew the law and those who had an inkling, some sense of what is right and wrong. And we see that they should have known what was right and wrong. Paul writes about it in chapter one, he writes about them forsaking God through idolatrous behavior, forsaking God by forsaking nature, and forsaking God by, by pride in chapter one. But he believes that all of that could be informed by nature. The law, he says, is an advantage to the Jew because then they can know what God requires of them. But even knowing what God required didn't stop them from sinning. And we see that in, in chapter uh, two, where Paul says to them, you know, you all would do good or you all know the law. You know what's right and wrong. You say a man shouldn't steal, but you steal. You, you know a man shouldn't commit certain sins, but you commit these sins. You have the law, but what you would do, you don't do. Now, I don't know how many of you all ever wanted to do right and ended up doing wrong, but not being a, a prophet at all. As I'm looking at y'all, even if you don't have your camera on, your last one of y'all have wanted to do some right and did some wrong. You wanted to go to church Sunday morning, but you stayed too late at the club Saturday night. I didn't mess with nobody. I'm just saying you was you had set your clothes out for Sunday and all of that, but, but a friend called and, and said, "You got to meet me here, and uh, we're going to stay a short while." You got there at nine o'clock at two a.m. You still you wanted to do right. And you have the proof of it, but you, you did wrong. Sometimes when we have done people right, wrong, we want to tell them, uh, ask them for forgiveness. But when we see them again, something comes into our minds. I ain't asking for nothing from this person. We want to do right, but we don't. Understand that what a natural moral law could not do, what a spiritual holy law could not do, the law of the spirit of life found in Jesus Christ could do. Well, how does it do it? How does it work? Know that one cannot be righteous by living a good moral life. Now, I'm talking evangelistically now. We meet people who live good lives, better lives than folk who come to worship sometimes. They are good people. They uh, donate blood. They donate to food banks. They, they stand up for social justice. They are moral people who go to work and, and don't harm anybody, don't give anybody any trouble. But the truth is, that one cannot become righteous living a good moral law because there will still be sin. There's a law of sin and death working at his or her members. Understand one cannot be righteous by working the works of the law. You can be like that rich young ruler who says to Jesus uh, in Luke chapter 18, all of these have I kept from my youth up. You can live by the law but you cannot become righteous by the law. There will be failures, even knowing the law. The only answer to the dilemma is that God does not accept us by our righteousness. God does not accept us by our works. 
but by the righteousness of Jesus Christ who died for the sins of all. You know the passage, Romans 3, 23. The part I'm reading is really to the Jews, but uh, it concludes by making the statement that is applicable to all. Romans 3 and verse 23, Paul writes there, uh, let me start at verse number 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all, them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his and that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now I asked in the beginning, how can a holy God have relationship with humanity and a humanity that sins because that, that, that humanity cannot make itself righteous by observing moral law. It cannot make itself righteous by observing the law of God working by faith because in both instances, we fail. We all fail. We, we wanted to do right, but we didn't do right. The only way that we can have that relationship with God is through his promise of bringing us into righteousness by his son, Jesus Christ. That is, those who are in Christ become righteous. Here's the challenge. Faith in the promise of God. Faith in the promise of God that all can be made righteous through Jesus Christ. Let me read uh, part of that. Romans chapter 5 and uh, verse number 1. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1. The Bible says, therefore, Here's how we justify, not by our moral behavior, not by observing the law. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Let me put it to you this way. One of the most famous movements in religion has been the Reformation movement. Martin Luther found himself in the context of a church that had, had uh, practiced works righteousness. And what Martin Luther uh, did uh, in protesting that, two books were on his mind, one of them from the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, the other, the book of Romans. And what became astounding in his generation is that he said uh, to those who were under Roman Catholicism, that all these works that you are doing don't bring you into any righteousness with God. You can live righteously and do good works all week long, but you don't get righteous before God through those works. Martin Luther said, you can only get righteous by faith in what God has promised. And if you observe what God has promised, God will not remember your sin anymore. That is, if you are in Christ Jesus, God will make you righteous, not because you didn't sin or won't ever sin, God will make you righteous because you put faith in the promise of justification in Christ Jesus. Now, there's a whole lot that goes with that, and a lot of threads come out of that, streams and rivers people make of that, but here it is, here it is simply at its core. You want salvation, you want to be whole with God, you want to be declared righteous, then take advantage of, uh, advantage of the grace of God through Faith in the promise of God manifests in his sending Jesus to be righteousness for us. He who knew no sin became sin. That uh, those of us who are not righteous could be righteous through Jesus Christ. So does that mean that we give up on living before God? Well, we can't, we can't, we can't entertain all of that tonight. One of the first things Brother Harris said when he came on the program, he got 30 minutes which means he meant that. There's nothing to play with. He wasn't planned. He's saying 30, 30 minutes. So when Paul says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin and death, he becomes doxologic. He reminds us again of what his what letter is about. He says, I praise God. I, I give God glory. I, 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 I lift up my hands to God, we would say. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so that with the mind I myself may serve, I serve the law of God uh, and with the flesh, but with the flesh, the law of sin. 
Then he says, there's no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. And the King James Version adds here, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But verse number two reads, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So here's what we're saying to those who haven't come to know God through Jesus. God certainly recognizes and appreciates are acknowledging the good that us to be successful. God is the one who's blessed us all of our lives. God blesses us before we even come to Jesus Christ. Uh, every good thing going on in our life, God is responsible for that. But our, our blessings have been multiplied when we come to know that God desires an even closer fellowship with us through his son, Jesus Christ, fellowship where we are justified before him have full fellowship and access to him because of his grace and mercy. Uh, and because of our faith in that grace and mercy that we can be saved even today by believing that Jesus did indeed die for our sins, be buried and rise again. Being willing to repent of a life outside of Christ and contrary to Christ, confessing Christ as Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10 being buried in baptism, but that sin problem is taken away because God can never have close fellowship with us until our sins are covered. That happens in baptism, Acts 22, 16, Acts 2, 38. Then we're sealed by God's Holy Spirit, gifted by God's Holy Spirit, or with God's Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 38, and by God's Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1, 13. Yes, God cares for all souls. All souls matter. And we're thankful to him tonight that we can, that all of us can have our problem, our sin problem taken care of in Christ Jesus. Turn you back over now to Brother Harris. He's muted. You're muted. <laughs> I forgot about that. I got so taken away with the message, I forgot all the knobs here that I'm supposed to deal with. But we do appreciate uh, the message. I'm sure there may be some questions uh, for you and we'd like for you to entertain those questions, help us to dig deeper into the word of God. Maggie, do you have any questions? Unmute. I don't have, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. I don't have a question, just a comment. Uh, this was such a wonderful and great reminder. Nothing new, but just a reminder. Just keep us on task and just continue to do what we're doing. Thank you, Brother Correa. Thank you. Okay. You got questions, Maggie? I always talk about other people when they're on mute and talking and I just did that. So, <laughs> but yes, I do have some questions. So our first question is how, hold on, before I read this one, let's take the one from the chat first. So the first question is what does it mean with the flesh, the law of sin in verse 25? Yeah, that, what, make sure. Yeah, what Paul has referenced to are those inclinations within us that keep us from living up to what we know is a God standard. Um, it affects us to the extent that what we would do, we don't end up doing. All of us have experience with that because uh, all of us have sinned when we wanted to, and other times we've sinned when we didn't think we were going to. Uh, and, and Paul says this is consistent as consistent in human beings. As, it, as would be a law, a law of nature, a law of nature. It's there. It's it's within us. They're with us every day. And uh, you take Paul, who who said about himself that he lived in all good conscience, that uh, he exceeded others uh, in how he lived, being more zealous of the traditions of the fathers, zealous of the law. He was uh, he lived more godly than his equals. But what Paul was confronted with is. As much as I have done, as much as I have accomplished, there's still something. 
uh, that keeps me from being what God would want me to be. And he sees as the only answer to that is to live serving God uh, with the uh, mind uh, seeking every day uh, to live uh, in patience before God and at the same time recognize his failures, but understanding that his failures are covered not by his works, but by his commitment to his faith in Christ Jesus. If he's got Christ Jesus, everything is going to be all right. That, that's what empowers him to keep going. God is not counting his sin against him. Okay. Let me say this. I remember when I was younger, oh. theme especially, a lot, of, lot, yeah, a lot of things I would say. I say, I'm not going to ever do this again. I'm not going to ever do this again. That was 1973. Here it is, 2020. I'm still doing it. So uh, the stuff we, we we hope we could stop, do better than, not do, is still there. There's a law working in our members that keeps us from being all that we want to be. So when we look at each other, you all know this already. We're not looking at perfect people. We're looking at people covered by the blood of Jesus. That's what we're looking at, who are striving to live to the glory of God. Yeah, okay. someone has asked, Mary McGee has asked, is it important for us to recognize that we have sinned in order to be forgiven? Uh, yeah, here's the thing. What, and, and we don't like to talk about this much in the church. I talked about this, I talked about this on, on Sunday. What separates us from God and what has always needed to be taken care of, even from the days of the prophets, is our sin problem. When Jeremiah 31 was written, Jeremiah says, what's going to happen is I'm going to put the laws of God in, in their heart. They won't teach every man his neighbor, nor saying, know the Lord. But then Jeremiah in that discourse says, and um, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Nothing can go forward with God until we recognize that we are sinners in need of the grace of God. We must know that it is sin that separates us from God. That's how we come to appreciate Jesus Christ. Okay, Brother Carruthers, the next question is, how do we rid ourselves of simple desires that causes us to sin? Part of the things we do is we don't make provision for the flesh. If, if for example, I've had relatives, maybe you have too, who are alcoholics. Well, one of the things he could do is not travel the same route home, right? Why are you going to pass by the ABC store every day? when you know you have an alcohol uh, problem, you have a temper problem, you're working on it. Why would you get into dis discussions where you're going to fly, out, fly off the handle? You don't make provision for the flesh, but then again, you, you accept the power of God's spirit and you're led by the spirit because filling our lives with those positive fruit of the spirit makes make it less likely that we would be overcome, overwhelmed by the desires of the flesh, be engaged in what is good. Like, like for example, uh, be committed structurally in life to worship and to be serious in worship. That's going to help our minds and our behavior. I'm not talking about just coming to church. I'm talking about coming to worship and to fellowship with the people of God. Now, you know this, and Brother Harris and several of us have discussed this during the season. A lot of preachers don't preach about sin these days. And I say on Sunday, they can't preach about sin. Many of our preachers who preach today, they, they preach for amens and hand claps, but they can't preach about adultery when they're going with four sisters and one brother in the church. You can't preach about sin when you have that going on. You, you, you can't preach about sin when you empower people in the church who are not faithful to teach your Bible class. Five out of eight of your teachers are shacking and you say, that's all right. You're not teaching people about the seriousness of sin and so you hear a lot of sermons about no weapon formed against you is going to defeat you. Yes, it will. Uh, when you're walking in sin, that God's on your side, that your blessings are about to come, all of that nonsense preachers preach that can be true. But if I won't live righteously and get out of sin or partner with sin, then the Bible doesn't teach that God's trying to move me on up 
to the east side uh, with Jefferson and them. That's not what the Bible teaches. But our preachers are preaching that. You know why they preach it? Because our members love to hear it. I think Paul called it itching ears. We would rather go to an assembly and hear a preacher never talk about sin than to be honest with ourselves and know that we need to rid ourselves of these boyfriends and girlfriends, both at on our neighborhood, the boyfriends and girlfriends um, on our job. You know, some people have work spouses. I mean, uh, yeah, work spouses. You know, they got a spouse at home and a, and a spouse at work. This duplicity uh, in our lives is the reason we don't talk about sin from our pulpits uh, any longer. And we, we have to get back to letting people know the reason you need Jesus is because of sin in your life. You don't need Jesus to get you a raise on your job, deal with your sin, and then your raise will come if God says the same. Okay, the next question is, can we rely on the Holy Spirit to help us overcome sinful behavior? The Holy Spirit is, is power for those who will allow themselves to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5 and verse number 18, the, the Spirit will direct us and, and guide us, as I mentioned earlier, if we're if we, uh, living right. Um, let me put it this way. My mother kept me out of sin by the power of my mother. I stayed out of sin because she had me to be in school during school hours. If I had forsaken her instruction and gotten in trouble, although she was leading me and empowering me by instructing me, then I still would have been in trouble. I must be willing to hear and to be led by God's Holy Spirit. To actually believe that there's a difference uh, in following God and following the inclinations of the, the flesh. And so we are empowered by God's Holy Spirit, yes, to live righteous uh, lives, but we have to want to. We have to want to be led by the Spirit. He doesn't force us. Uh, he's not throwing us around. Sometimes in our churches, we get to singing nonsense. The Spirit is high today. We tell you something, the Spirit don't get drunk. He's not high. He's not high. Uh, he set it on fire today. You don't want the spirit to set fire on you in your church. Fires for those who condemn. Our God is a consuming fire. But, but we, we say a whole lot of stuff in our churches that are not been, that's not been replaced. And it's because, you know, we decided we knew everything. Uh, we don't need Bible class. We don't need church. We've got a degree, a social degree, a uh, bachelor's degree, a uh, master's degree a doctorate degree, a post-doctorate experience with some smart people, but we still sinners who need Jesus Christ. Uh, the best of us can only ever be so intelligent. And that intelligence does not measure up to the wisdom of God at any level. It remains foolishness with God. So we need to be humble enough to allow God to lead us. I, I wanna say, we need Jesus. We need Jesus uh, in our lives, everybody does. And uh, we need to be willing uh, to hear what he says and to follow God's spirit. When I'm talking about being led in spirit, I'm talking about Galatians chapter five, as well as Ephesians chapter five, when I talk about being filled uh, in spirit. You got any more questions, Maggie? Um, I have one more if no one from the chat would like to put one in. Is there not one in the chat? They've been answered. Um, are Christians required to glorify God in their physical bodies as well as in their spirits? Uh -huh. I didn't think my stomach was showing tonight. Why are you picking? <laughs> you know, <all> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So long as we understand this, uh, bodily exercise profits little. Uh, that uh, what really profit, profits us is godliness. Even the apostles talked about God's people being well, being in good health, Second John, these kinds of things. We certainly should not uh, be abusive to what God uh, has given us. Be mindful that God does want us healthy. We pray, we pray for our health. As Moses is, is receiving the law, God is saying to him that if they walk upright, they won't have the diseases of those around them that and that would be blessed in their in their bodies. It, equally so, God 
doesn't wait to heaven to bless us. God blesses us right now uh, in this life. We should live it to its fullest, but we should not do this. I know a church that's passed during the pandemic, they canceled their Bible class to have, um, to have gymnastics on Wednesday night. Uh, no, don't do that. Uh, keep your Bible class and find another night for gymnastics. Spiritual development uh, among the children of God. And our first priority with our assembly is to encourage and build up each other uh, in the word. We can have fellowship, sewing, knitting, learning how to operate cameras, Zoom, and even gymnastics. Don't start substituting uh, the Bible time for building up the flesh. Yeah. Dr. Carruthers? Yes. Are there any, is that something you'd like to share with us that you didn't get a chance to, to do while in your presentation? Yeah, I want to say again, we appreciate everyone uh, who's on tonight, Doc Almond or in other places, preaching Crawford Road. Appreciate Sister Carruthers. Uh, I met her a year before I met Brother Harris, but I married her in 1983. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and let me go over again that uh, uh, the good news tonight is that we all understand that uh, God knows our, our weaknesses, our failures, but he's made provision for our sin, for our weakness, our failures. He didn't, he does not make that provision regrettably. He makes that provision because he loves us, is what the text says in John 3, 15. What he encourages us to do then is to have faith in his promise. That's what chapter four is about in the book of Romans that Abraham was not saved by his works or by circumcision, but because of his faith in the promises. And uh, as difficult it is for us to accept sometimes, the overriding factor in our salvation is not our goodness, not our works, but it's the blood of Jesus Christ. So we need to worship him, praise him, hold on to him, glorify him, so that the Father may be glorified. As we deal with developing new members in the body of Christ, and as we think about passages that we're looking at in the Epistle to the Romans, can you give us some guidance or some advice on the simplifying of this message for those who have no skills in studying the Word of God? What would you say to us in trying to make sure that we don't miss people? I think I would, I would start where Paul starts in chapter one with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What he says is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed. We learn about God's righteousness by way of the gospel. And that gospel says that God saves us through Jesus all by himself. And simply put to the new convert, you've been saved because of what Jesus has done, not because of your strength or your intellect or your wisdom. And now you have been empowered by that gospel to live to the glory of God. In chapter eight, uh, God's spirit uh, empowers you, seals you, makes you, his, uh, makes you his child. If this sounds too good for you, understand it's always been about God's choice according to Romans 9 through 11, he has mercy upon whom he will have mercy. He demonstrated that mercy on the sons of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob upon Israel. He chose them according to his will, and he chooses those of us in Christ Jesus. To be saved. And then to remember that he follows up that mercy lesson in Rome, with Romans 12 by saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that by the mercies of God that uh, because you've been shown mercy and grace, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your, your reasonable uh, service. 
Salvation came through Jesus. God did it for us. We didn't do it for ourselves. He keeps us by his spirit. And then he invites us to live to his glory. And at the most basic level, uh, that's where we can all begin accepting that salvation, appreciating that invitation to work, and allowing that those works to glorify uh, God. Maggie, would you check the chat to see if, that, if those are questions that are coming in there? No questions, just people praising um, Dr. Carruthers' message. It has been a great message, and Dr. Carruthers is very skilled at sharing these men. Very insightful, too, in distinguishing the fine elements between the truth and error and does a lot to help us keep on track. He's working to help the millennials and uh, the baby boomers to find that path of togetherness in the body of Christ. And I'm praying for the success of that venue, hoping that God will bring us to the same common faith as we grow older and as we move forward. It's been a joy to hear you on this evening. Before releasing everyone, I'd like to uh, let you know what's coming down the pack. Uh, next week, we're gonna be privileged to hear from Brother John Marshall, and he'll be texting, uh, speaking from the text of Romans 10. And his text will be, his subject will be, Faith Comes by Hearing. This will be a great uh, topic for these days and times especially when the rest of that is hearing by the word of God. And so that it not only clarifies how, but it clarifies what. And we're hoping that that will be the outcome of that session next week, Brother John Marshall, dealing with faith comes by hearing. And as we move forward down the road, we have some great lessons that are coming up. Uh, Brother Robin Mitchell will be speaking on, uh, put you on the Lord Jesus and make not provision for the flesh on the first week of February. It'll be followed by Brother Theodos King. It will be speaking on joy in the midst of a storm. And then uh, digging deep into the month of February, we'll be receiving messages uh, like civil rights, racism, injustice, and protests, of women in the Church of Christ in the 21st century, premarital relations, marriage, divorce, and singleness, and the power to change or overcome some lifestyle choice. So those are topics that are coming up and speakers from around the country will be sharing those messages with us. And again, Dr. Carruthers, we thank you so much for the powerful message that you've shared with us on this evening. Um, thank you, brother. Thank you, Dr. Harris, for this opportunity. And we're praying that God continue to bless all. Uh, would you, would you uh, just tell us about uh, the book that's coming out, uh, Someone Must Come Preaching. Yeah, um, this work uh, was uh, developed by Brother Michael Crusoe. He has engaged older preachers, millennial preachers, Generation X. Um, our generation, what, what's our generation, Brother Harris? We're, we're, we're baby boomers. <laughs> baby boomers, yeah. But I'm at the other end of the baby boomers. And thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> baby boomers, and several preachers have come together. Um, I've done the introduction to the call of the preacher uh, as the first, I think, chapter of the book. We also have discussions uh, in the book, um, in the book uh, related to various issues that have transpired in 2021. It's not just a book of sermons. There are interviews, uh, there are lessons and things of this nature. Uh, they've already gotten 15 orders uh, from church in South Central, is that uh, here in North Carolina? Dublin is one of the contributors, so they picked up 15 copies a few weeks ago. Um, so was saying to me, and uh, I, I, and he asked me how many we were getting, and I, I, I was kind of mum right then. I didn't know what to say. Now that we got elders and stuff on this call tonight. I can say, you you know, Dublin and them got 15, what, what are we gonna do? Uh, as far as, but if somebody must come preaching, 
we thank thankful for all of the contributors, Brother Harris and everybody in that book. And we encourage you to pick up a copy. I think it's going to come out. Um, you remember Brother Harris, uh, May or June? Or... I forget the, the release date. Uh, I know that they're, they're doing advanced sales right now for the book. It, yeah, the advanced sales are $15 each. I think later on there'll be $20, uh, each, but there's a lot of good information. Young preachers and older preachers. I can't wait to get it because I want to hear what these younger preachers are saying. Uh, and uh, so I can have something to argue about. But uh, anyway, yeah, we look forward to the release. Okay. Uh, Chris Long, if you're on, would you, would, you, would you let me know that you're here? Chris Long. Robert Maxwell, are you still are you still on the line? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so, uh, at this time, we're going to call up on you to give us our final prayer for today. Okay, let us pray. Oh dear God, how powerful you are, Father and how you empowered so many of us, Father, to speak your word. And we're just so grateful for Brother Columbus, Father. Powerful messages coming from the Brotherhood, Father. We're just grateful that we have this platform that we can come and listen and learn, increasing our knowledge, because we realize knowledge is power. And your, and your scriptures, Father, are the most powerful words that we need today. Thankful, Father, for all those that have come and all those that ask the question, Father, get the questions answered, Father. And Father, this is this, this, these lessons are not just for us to keep, but these lessons are for us to spread the good news of the gospel. Let mm -hmm. them know that Christ is Christ, Jesus Christ saves today, Father. So bless Brother Christ, bless his congregation, bless his family, Father. Bless Brother Harris, bless the McAlma Church of Christ, Father, for helping us to learn more about. Saving souls, Father. We just started out this year with this evangelistic effort, Father. The Great Commission is what we are about to do, to do, do in, Father. So let us all pray for one another, Father. Let us all lift each other up. And let us, Father, tell others about this great, 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 great lessons that are coming every Tuesday. Bless us now, Father. Forgive us for our sin. We ask all this now, dear son. Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 I want to express my apologies to Chris Long. He said he was there, but I couldn't hear him. I'm sorry about that, Chris. Uh, I'd, like a, I'd like a second chance to invite you back uh, to lead prayer on the program. Maggie, we're back in your hand. Right, Okay, so thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Carruthers, for that excellent message. And also, it's nice to see your lovely wife on here, Sister Felicia, and uh, your Carver Road family. Um, so once again, thank you all so much for being here. We're in week three, and we are still going strong. The message will be available on Facebook and YouTube. Give us a couple days. We're still trying to work through uh, live streaming it, but just check our McAlmon Church of Christ YouTube page, our McAlmon Church of Christ Facebook page, uh, probably in a day or two, and you can share, repost, so that anybody that missed it can go back and hear this wonderful message. So thank you all for joining us. We'll be back next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. So we will see you all then. Have a good night. <laughs>